Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Baturka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by Deborah Kimmett, a fellow licensed massage therapist from the state of Montana with over 30 years of experience as a massage therapist. She is also a certified teacher with the Alliance for Massage Therapy Education and founder of LMT Body Politic, which we will talk more about. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now you are here as part of my ongoing series to interview a massage therapist from every state, and you're here to represent Montana. And I can't imagine any other person from your state being more qualified to discuss your state. And I say oh. that because you're the first Montana Board of Massage, or you, you were appointed to the first board, Montana Board of Massage Therapy, and you hold Montana license number one. Yeah. How cool I is do. that? That is really cool. Just, uh, mine's like 1774. Yours is just straight up number one. Yeah. That's so neat. What, a, what, a, what an honor that must be. And you were yeah. instrumental in making that happen behind the scenes. You've, you're very involved in that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was, I, um, uh, was part of a group that worked with the AMT, the local AMTA, the Montana chapter of the AMTA and some other folks. Um, uh, the group that I belong to helped shepherd the bill as well. Uh, I, um, am executive director also of another group called the business league for massage therapy and body work. It's quite the name, but <laughs> you know, some of the people really wanted that word business league in there cause we are a nonprofit business uh. league. And so we, um, we do a lot of advocacy work. We do uh, uh, legislative monitoring. We monitor the board. We monitor uh, the AMTA chapter. We just keep an eye out and, and sort of a pulse on what's going on throughout the state. Wow. It's incredible. So usually before we talk about your state, I like to get a little origin story about you as a therapist back 30 years ago before you were more than that. Before, yeah, how been, did you come to the profession? Well, I was um, in my late twenties and was doing um, uh, sort of the the exploration thing of trying out different things, you know. And and uh, one of the things that I kept seeing was learn about the mind body connection or the body mind connection, and it just really made me very curious. And so I actually signed up for a basic 120 hour Swedish course before I'd ever even had a massage. Hmm. Um, I just thought that it was something I wanted to explore. So I was able to, and, and, uh, traveled on weekends to, uh, to take the courses. And from there, I found that I just fell in love with it and That's just amazing. really loved it. So, so does that mean you had, you were working on someone else before you had ever had work done on yourself? Um, well, in the classes, oh, you know, I see. not, you know, we, I, I hadn't, I didn't have a massage. I signed up for the class and I hadn't even had a massage for myself at that point. And then, you know, the instructor who was setting up the courses said, well, you got to have a massage. So she gave me one oh. herself. So, <laughs> so, but I was all in at that point because I wanted to learn about the body mind connection Oh yeah, and, and how that all fit together. And once I started getting into it, I just found that it was, uh, a calling for me. It was just really important. Yeah, that's great. So again, you're you're very much in the know for your state. So just give us a little a sense of what it takes to become a massage therapist currently in the state of Montana and to maintain a license there. Well, uh, we have the basic 500 hours of training plus an examination. Uh, and right now, now we are accepting pretty much all the examinations or a state equivalent uh, to like the MBLAC, CNCB, um, because because w the state hasn't gotten rid of the NC, you know, the national certification exam for the 700 hours or whatever it is that they are right now, because um, there are a lot of people who are coming to Montana who have years of experience and took it back when it was only a 500 hour thing. So the state has kept that in place. The board has kept that in place. So pretty much any of the national examinations that are out there, mm -hmm. uh, we accept. So you have to have the 500 hours in a test. Um, the uh, 500 hours loosely follows or follows the uh, the uh, uh, old national certification um, uh, guidelines, curriculum guidelines for a 500 hour course. 
uh, because they had that set up. And the way the statute's written is that it has to be through uh, the National Certifying Council of Agencies. And uh, and NCBTMB was the only one at the time that really did that, or one of the few at the time that had that. So the state adopted the curriculum guidelines of 200 hours of in-class training, et cetera. Um, and, uh, so, so basically 500 hours with certain curriculum guidelines and a test is the basics for, for practicing in Montana. Uh, the board actually last week just passed, um, uh, a, uh, new rule to take place that for people who are, have a license somewhere else, they don't have to follow those curriculum guidelines. So if you've got a valid license somewhere else, Five, that it's at least 500 hours mm -hmm. and you have a test uh, and the state requires a test, then you can get a license in Montana. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty easy reciprocity to, to come practice there. Right. Only I think it's Arizona that's even la more lax than ours, uh, which mm. is you got a license somewhere else. You can practice somewhere else. You can practice yeah, you in the state. You'll have to go through the process of letting them know what you, you can't just show up and say, I'm good. Yeah, you got you got to apply and get yeah. you know apply for a license. They call it um license. They call it the out of state license application or whatever. Oh. So so you have to apply for licensure. Each state does pretty much require an out of state license, you know. And and uh, we haven't moved to like what the nurses and PTs are moving towards, which are compacts. Um, you know, uh, and compacts are if you have a license in Montana. And Idaho is part of a compact, for example, or mm -hmm. Washington State is part of the compact. Then you don't have to get that Idaho or Washington license. Okay, oh. so and vice versa, somebody coming in from Washington wouldn't have to get a Montana license if they're part of the compact. But that doesn't exist. Okay, ah. um, but it's what what um, other professions are moving towards to help with developing more of a national standard or allowing people to cross state lines to make it easier for people to work um, yeah. in various jurisdictions. Okay. Yeah. That would help with my, with my dream to one day drive an RV across the country and practice wherever I am. Yes, that would definitely <laughs> help, wouldn't it? But you know, the compacts, I think we're probably years down the road from that. Yeah. Um, unless, unless people move for, forward on that soon, but. Um, so we're years yeah. from the idea of the compacts and then probably decades away from any thought of a unifying cross country standard. Well, I think that that's difficult. I mean, because any profession, they don't have that. No, no yeah. license, you know, licensing is something that's left to the States. And so there's really, um, where the unifying standard comes from is usually through the associations or through a national certification kind of thing. Uh, or, um, you know, like MBLEX is part of trying to help, I think, create uh, a national standard that way in terms of a testing standard. But, um, but licensing is a state by state thing and, and the states don't want to give up that power. Yeah. What about like a, so I'm still like caught on this idea of me driving an RV. What about like a yeah. visitor's pass or something like letting them know you'll be passing through their state for a short amount of time or. Well, you know, some states I think do that, oh, okay. but, Montan but Montana is not one of them. Yeah. Um, we allow someone to come in on an emergency basis, um, you know, because that's something that the state legislature here passed for all professions that someone yeah. can come in and work, you know, they have to apply for it, et cetera. But, um, but it is available um, on, on an emergency or, you know, basis, uh, like if there was a natural disaster here, like if Yellowstone blew up or something, you know, um, then uh, uh, people can come in and work in the state. And they it's needed to, it's uh, mainly to help with natural disasters. They needed to mobilize an army of body workers to take yeah. care of the people. Yeah, well, and there's, you know, that does happen. Yeah. You know, like 9-11, Katrina, yeah. massage therapists were mobilizing and helping people. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then to get back to your other half of the question, yes. which is what it takes to maintaining yeah. it, is that uh, we have a requirement, requirement of 12 hours of continuing education every two years. Okay. So you take one course, one weekend class every two years, and that's enough. And the course is um, it's very loose. The state doesn't regulate that. Our state doesn't regulate schools and it doesn't regulate continuing education providers. 
Uh, so anybody can come in and teach, but all the massage therapist has to prove is how it helps them in their practice. So if it's a business course, an accounting course, you know, helping them keep their books or a first aid class or uh, any kind of business development courses, any of those things in addition to the hands-on or online trainings are acceptable for Montana. So it's okay. pretty loose. Pretty loose seems pretty easy to, to get those 12 hours yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that came in during the whole licensing process. You know, when you put it in state statute that, that the legislator wanted something for all the people who grandfathered in, she wanted continuing education for all the people who, who uh, sort of were grandfathered into licensing um, as a way to um, make sure that they at least got some training. But when you look at the role of continuing education, really, there was a report came out in the 90s called the Pew Report on Health Care Workforce. And what they talked about in there was how continuing education really didn't do anything for continued competency, really. And so a lot of states were starting to get rid of it. And then some states started moving towards what they called continued competence. So that's partly where that comes from is how do you maintain a person's competency and how do you test for that and ensure that they do that versus uh, just um, taking a class and saying, yeah, I took that class, which is basically right. what Montana and a lot of other states do. What's your feeling on it? Do you feel like CE requirements should be more specific and more thorough? Well, I like the, I like the way uh, of the original federation kind of thing where they were starting to dip their toe into doing some continuing education for disciplinary cases, like having a course that a someone who's disciplined, like for example, they um, got caught out not draping properly. And so they are required to take a draping class in order mm. to be able to work again. Uh, those kinds of things can be very, very helpful. Um, what I think is sort of difficult is when a state or like, for example, the National Certification Board requires an ethics course um, every two years or every three years or whatever, how many ethic, different ethics courses can you take over the span of a 30 year uh, <laughs> a thirty year thing? You know, I mean, I could see requiring ethics courses periodically throughout the career or at the very beginning, making sure that, that people are on the same page with regards to ethics, but to just have a blanket requirement that you've got to have so many ethics courses every year kind of gets in the way of, of I think, what really ethics is about, because then you start taking ethics courses just to find an ethics course to take versus really being interested in trying to learn something from ethics. Yeah. Yeah, I I recently renewed my license after a, a period of being inactive while I was raising some small kids, and I sort of I, Oregon has this this ethics requirement, and I I went in sort of like oh I have to check this box. I was just fortunate to go to my my massage therapy alma mater, East West College here in Portland, and just had this awesome class. Yeah. So like I got so much out of it, and it made me think like oh I can't wait to have to take this again. So, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah and there's, the quality and there's, of the class you find can, can make the difference, too. Right. And in a rural place like Montana, we have, you know, more, more cows than people here uh, <laughs> and more bars than churches. I mean, this is, you know, there's a, I live in I live in a, a, a small city of about 60,000. OK. And um, uh, there's about maybe five small cities like that. Uh, in, in the whole state, but the rest of Montana is really rural. So for therapists who live out in the middle of, and there's actually a town called Two Dot, uh, in Two Dot, Montana, yeah. um, or Baker, Montana, or some of these little tiny towns, it, it can cost a lot of money to get in-person yeah. continuing education. And so really online education is really what most massage therapists can afford because again, you're looking at, you know, a, a low uh, yearly income along with um, people holding down a job, you know, according to the statistics that are out yeah. there. Holding well, a I would be, job. I'd be unsurprised to, to find after the current shutdown crisis that this education in this type of setting, Zoom calls, and it's going to be on the rise. So maybe access oh, yeah. to the more great educators anywhere in the world would be a nice thing to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So 
we are, as I just just said, the 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 crisis is still happening. COVID nineteen, coronavirus. Can you take us through what what has gone on in in your state as as regards to that and and where it sits now? Yeah, our governor um, our governor is a Democrat in a red state. Um, Montanans tend to be more libertarian. I'm not, but um, a lot of Montanans are more libertarian, so they want to have a check and balance. They might elect the Democratic governor, but a but a Republican legislature. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of push pull, and our governor actually closed things down really early, as mm-hmm. soon as the first cases hit um, here. Uh, and in fact, I closed my practice the day be- because we were surrounded with cases, and because of the lack of testing, I knew there were cases where I was at. So I shut down my practice. And then the next day he shut down the state of Montana, you know, and and really put in a lot of, of, of restrictions, um, you know, only necessary travel, uh, you know, all the things that people are doing nationally that Mm -hmm. you've heard about. Um, but we're also one of the first ones to reopen Mm -hmm. as well. And, um, uh, when they shut the state of Montana down, that was in mid March. Uh, and, uh, but when you look at the statistics and and they don't seem to really care about the total number of cases. So when people say, oh, we've only had so many cases or we've had a lot of cases or whatever, that's not what governors are looking at in terms of reopening. They're looking at the numbers of new cases. And so our new cases in the state are down between zero and two a day. Mm. Um, so it's not very many. And in fact, Montana, if you look, uh, I think it's on the CNN website where they have all the state to statistics listed. Um, Montana is 49th out of 50 states oh, wow. in terms of the number of ca- total number of cases, which we have about um, as of yesterday when they reported it was 470. Okay. And so we we don't have that many cases here. Uh, we have pockets in the more urban areas where a lot of cases have shown up, and then a few rural areas where cases showed up, like in northern Montana, a nursing home was hit really hard and had most of the deaths that were in the state, um, which is a really sad thing. So we so so the state was closed down early, uh, and then the counties. Uh, decided what they were going to do with massage, for example. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the the governor the governor is also running for a Senate seat now against a Republican, so he's really balancing the politics as well as the health yeah. public health thing. Because again, you know, the the more conservative folks are really pushing to reopen. Yeah. Unfortunately, what he did though was he lumped us in with personal services. Lumped massage therapy in with personal services, uh, and uh, and is allowing massage therapy to open in phase one. So okay. massage therapists have been practicing now for probably two or three weeks, I think, okay. um, or a couple of weeks anyway, throughout the state. But then, like my county, we closed down for an extra week or two, and I now see. now uh, people can practice in my city, uh, and I'm not. Okay. Um, because because I'm looking at the science of what's going on, and and all of my clients are high risk. Um, uh, they either have immunosuppressed uh, uh, immune sim- you know immune systems, or they are um, uh, seventy or older, sixty five, mm. seventy or older, and um, I just can't put them at risk. Uh, I'm I personally am going through some of the steps to do some of the things to reopen, but I'm holding off for as long as I can in terms of, um, uh, you know, cause there's pressure from clients, there's pressure from the city, uh, yeah. and the County and the state to do reopening things. And so I'm, I'm waiting, still hunkered down. Are you waiting for testing to get better or just case numbers to totally bottom out? Or what do you, what sign would well, you like to see before you're comfortable? Well, before I'm comfortable, I'd like for us to get through the tourist season, really, uh, when it comes right down to it. Because, I mean, I don't see a lot of tourists, but there are people around me that see tourists and or they're they're not very careful about how they expose themselves. And so, you know, I'm trying to be really careful about how I expose myself, but having to go to the grocery store or having to go to the hardware store to pick up something. Um, that still exposes me, even if I'm wearing a mask. Mm-hmm. And so, um, 
I'm just wanting to be extra careful about all that. And, and unfortunately, the way the statistics are working, at least the way I've seen it is, is that if somebody comes to Montana and infects people, that individual is not counted towards our state to statistics. They're counted towards that the state, their state of origin statistics. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what, what I'm looking at is like, uh, anywhere from four to six weeks after the tourist season gets started is when I think we'll probably see an uptick because it needs to kind of get through at least two or three 14 day periods. Okay. Um, uh, in order for it, you starting to see it pop up in the, in the, um, 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 uh, statistics in terms yeah. of locals, et cetera. But with, with all that happening, Montana is a big tourist state. We have so few COVID cases here that I'm just thinking there's all these people who are thinking, Oh, let's go to Montana because, you know, let's go to see m most people think of Yellowstone being in Montana. Well, there's only just a couple of entrances in Montana, but the bulk of the park is in Wyoming, okay. but we've got Glacier national park here. And those are two major, major tourist destinations. Yeah. And, um, and Missoula can be a gateway where I live can be a, a gateway for both. So people can land in Missoula and easily drive in a day to either, either park mm -hmm. um, if they're planning on taking in both parks. And so, so I just really am seeing that uh, the tourist season is, is going to be uh, the real telltale here in terms of, of what happens next in our state. Yeah. I guess we will have to keep an eye on all these things as it develops. Yeah. So, so what do you think, how does massage therapy come out of this? What, what looks different from, from your perspective, the, the good or the bad? Yeah, well, I think, I think we'll come out stronger in the yeah. sense that people are going to be touch deprived and they want touch, uh, for and particularly people who've been self-isolating, who don't have a lot of, um, uh, you know, they don't have a core family that they've isolated with. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I, so I think people are going to be touch deprived. I also think that our practices are going to look a little different for, for at least the next couple of years, yeah. uh, un until there's a vaccine in place until there's contact tracing and all of those kinds of things really put in the place as well as, uh, um, uh, uh immune testing, uh, mm -hmm. as well, you know, and again, even with immune testing, uh, we don't know yet whether or not if somebody who's tests with the antibodies, whether or not they're really actually immune, that we don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody could recontract contract the, the virus, and we don't know at the time frame between the time that they've had it one time and when they can catch it the next time. We just right. don't know that again. So um, the, the, the um, AIDS crisis was before my time as a massage therapist, but in talking to massage therapists about all of it, um, this is really very similar to that because, uh, in the sense of back then, there was no such thing as universal pre precautions around uh, blood and bodily fluids at all. There mm -hmm. wasn't any, any precautions. We didn't know any better. And then the crisis, AIDS crisis happened and HIV came on the fore and, um, and then we started developing universal precautions. So I see this as sort of the next step in that. Um, I think a lot of massage therapists in the past have been very good about sanitizing their spaces, but not very good about disinfecting and making mm -hmm. sure that everything is disinfected in their spaces. And I think that that, that's, that piece is going to change a lot. Well, How and we take care of our space. And having, I mean, just looking at your space and realizing that it's difficult, it would be difficult to disinfect in a, in a real way, you know, like a lot of porous materials and carpet and curtains and all the, yeah, I think there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about just revamping the way spaces are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of work in yeah. that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I'm also doing in preparation for when I am opening practice, because yeah. I have, you know, a couple of nice big area rugs and those are going to have to go in. Um, just, you know, having enclosed containers versus the open, you know, I have a, I have a Soji screen with racks behind it to hide everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, I do have my sheets and stuff in an, in an enclosed space, but, um, but I had a lot of, 
uh, equipment sitting out. And it's like, nope, those are all going to have to go in closed containers to be sanitized. And if I, and only get out the stuff that I'm going to be using in that mm -hmm. session. So I, and so yesterday I went and bought two, two smaller containers that can hold a towel each. So I use a hydrocolator and I've got to figure out how to make sure that I can keep those uh, hydrocolator packs disinfected now because the heat in the dis in the hydrocolator in my mind isn't enough. So I've got to see how I can keep those packs done. But, um, but sometimes I use them on people and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I use one uh, towel and sometimes I use two. So I went out and bought two containers so I can put a towel in each container. So if I only use one towel that day, I'm not contaminating all of my towels by opening up a big bin with my towels in there. I'm only doing that one or I'm, op I'm, or I'm not opening up a container where I'm um, uh, to use one towel and then infect the other towel, you know, yeah. that needs to be thrown in the wash. So I got two little separate containers that I can put a towel in. Yeah. And, towel all, in to do and that all of that, stuff. all of that navigating, all of that, that change makes me think like more time between clients just keeps getting more. Like I've all, I started, when I restarted my practice, I, I just made 30 minutes between clients. And now I'm just like 45 that all talking about all the different things you need to now worry about, like makes me think it's going to be a full hour between. Yeah. Well, and that's what I'm thinking too, because yeah. I did the same thing as you. I did uh, 30, I have 30 minutes between clients because some clients like to run over, they chat for a minute or two and that kind of stuff. And, um, or I do have some clients who like to come a little bit early and it's mm -hmm. like all those behaviors are going to have to change now. Yeah. Uh, in terms of being able to make sure that there's no interaction of client to client, you know, the next client coming in while the one client's leaving. So I'm yep. going to have to really end that or make sure that clients don't come in early, that it kind of me, thing. It makes so me really like, want to keep an eye on the, what the, the chains are going to do. Are they mm -hmm. going, are they going to adapt? I know a lot of what, of how they operate is based on that you know, on the hour, that constant, you know, f five minutes in between clients. So I haven't read anything yet. I'm, I'll be curious to go look that up. But Yeah, I just saw a Facebook post about that yesterday the, oh. that somebody had aggregated what each of the, you know, uh, the the postings from each of the chains, what they're oh. doing and, <laughs> and um, not necessarily super hopeful. No. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there is one that's now going to 15 minutes between clients, I think. Oh man. So yeah. I just, I, I have experience working in those places and I mean, it used to be an hour, an hour session was actually only 50 minutes on the table, which was, you know, so they had five in the front and five in the back, but it essentially meant there was zero minutes in between because it was just right. like, by the time the person was like ready to go and you were chatting with them and giving them their water, it was like, the next person was already there and then you were behind all day. Yeah. Like 15 minutes. Uh, yeah. That's a whole nother yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, particularly when disinfecting agents yeah. don't, I mean, take time to, to dry. Yeah, Cause like I just surface some of them for 10 minutes or more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I saw a video, you know, about supposed sanitary practices and see, this is something that I would have done until I learned this in putting together videos with another colleague of mine who knows about disinfecting protocols. See, I was great sanitizer, but not necessarily a great disinfector. Mm. I'd spray the stuff off and wipe it off. Well, mm -hmm. you can't do that. You've got to let it sit yep. and saturate it enough. So those behaviors are going to have to change in terms of how we do things. Yeah. So since uh, I didn't, um, didn't prep you on this, but this is something that'll be easy for you to talk about, I think. With 30 years of experience, I, I always like to, to talk to a, a fellow therapist about longevity in the career. And so that's that's a long time to, to keep, to keep it up, to protect yourself. What would you say to, to young therapists about maintaining a career for such a long time? Biomechanics, being yeah. very careful about how you use your body. I mean, the first two weeks that I had a full load, I blew my thumbs out. So oh, wow. I was basically massaging with my hands <laughs> <laughs> like that, no thumbs. And so I had to, teach myself all these techniques of how not to use my thumbs yeah and then of course I got into uh, like neuromuscular therapy which is all about using the thumbs so it's like okay uh -huh. how do we how do I adapt that to really fit for me um, and and also making sure that you're 
taking care of your own body in how you work around the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and also understanding your limits, um, staying strong, making sure that you're staying strong. But like, for example, early in my career or, or when I started doing um, a lot of writing with regards to politics, I was working full time and trying to type full time. So I was, you know, spending, you know, six to eight sessions during the daytime and spending my evenings typing and I started developing other problems. And so yeah. it was like, okay, well, you've got to cut back on both in order to be able to do both. Oh, wow. So, so figuring out what your limits are in terms of the activities that you have, um, even simple things like wearing a watch or wearing a bracelet actually harmed my wrists, you know, that I found that it created too much pressure on my wrists when I was doing body work. Um, mm. you know, and so, so figuring out the little hints, little things, taking care of yourself. The other thing is, is finding things that interest you in the field. Um, mm. because part of it is that I know massage therapists who get bored with what they're doing. It's like, yeah. well, how do I, how do I keep this fresh? How do I keep that interesting? And that's where continuing education can come into play is yeah. helping to keep the therapist fresh learn a new technique, uh, learn, learn, you know, step outside of yourself and try and figure out something different. That um, is one of the do. things that I'm an, I'm an ABMP person. I think you are too. I am. Yeah. I was one of the things I really appreciate about it, about that membership is the access to all that continuing education that you can just kind of dip into and see if it's something you're, you're interested in. And yeah. 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 And I, and I always recommend doing that even if you don't incorporate those techniques into your practice, Yeah, you know, if you decide that you don't want to do that, but at least you've kind of, maybe you might've learned just one key thing, yeah. like how to breathe a little bit differently or how to engage your clients in just a slightly different way that may not have been a part of the actual course but the instructor embodied this thing of, of how she interacted or how he interacted or they interacted with the um, client or the, you know, the, the demonstration person on the table that, Oh, okay. That that's, that's great. I can take that piece and put it into my, into my practice. So if there's always just one little thing that I can glean, then, then I'm happy with a cat yeah. class, even if I didn't enjoy the rest of the class. Yeah, that's great. So the, the LMT body politic is something that you founded. And mm -hmm. I just want to, just as a primer for people, I'm going to read the, I guess it's maybe a mission statement. Well, this is a good way to start. I think the goal of LMT body politic is to create a cohesive organized voice for the massage therapy profession for the purpose of promoting massage therapy as a healthcare profession. And it's, well, I don't know. Maybe you could give us a little bit more of a primer on that. I think it's a, it's a really important organization that you're developing and working on and writing some great articles, blog posts and papers and yeah, well, yeah. I, I do have limited time, so there's not a whole ton of content where uh, a few of us have collaborated together to put up some things for the COVID-19 to help people minim mitigate some of the risk around going back to practice because as mm -hmm. I said in, in my state people are going back to practice whether it's a good idea or not and we'd like to make sure that people are staying as safe as they possibly can but the whole idea behind LMT body politic was born out of having um, uh, sort of a little emergency pop up in one of the larger cities in Montana uh, they were going to enact uh, uh, establishment licensing and in fact I just got word this weekend that that the person who's behind trying to do it is at it again. So I'm going to have to jump into that foray. But um, but what I really recognized was a couple of things: is that uh, it's always the same people doing all the work, mm -hmm. and when people have said that they're interested, uh, and I try to have a dialogue with them, there's something that's that's there's a disconnect. So it's like, well, how can we provide training resources? How can we uh, help recruit the activists of tomorrow? You know, because a lot of us are aging out. I'm I'm still have quite a few years left in me. I hope. Mm -hmm. um, I always say I'm going to keep keep at this until I drop. Uh, <laughs> but um, but a lot of folks are aging out, and, and we need to figure out. How we can bring new people on board, provide training resources, as well as sort of be a think tank in an essence of what are some of the policies that are happening? Because one of the things that I've really noticed is that um, 
uh, the associations are stepping into that void. They, they both have government relations people who are that, but when, but you have to also stop and think about what professional associations are about. And it's about protecting their memberships, which can inherently provide a conflict of interest because if they, because if they make choices that are for their memberships, it may not necessarily be the best thing for the profession. And I think, you know, people are attacking the professional associations all the time for not taking a stand on thing or things or doing things. But the problem is, is that because of the politics of all the different massage therapists involved in that, and in this whole COVID-19 crisis has really brought that out of most of our industry leaders saying it's not safe to practice until phase three. And then you've got other people saying, well, if we're saying we're healthcare, then we should be able to practice now. Even mm-hmm. though some of those industry leaders are working in the healthcare field saying, yeah, we need to put a pause on our practice because we need to, you know, we're not essential, you know, and then there's this whole big blow up over that word essential. Yeah. So, so because you've got people, a wide spectrum of people, those associations are not going to alienate their memberships. So they're not going to take a definitive stand on things. The other thing that I've noticed is along with that, is that um, how they approach it is, you know, everybody wants to be a big player. You know, they want to get in there and work with people. And so how do you do politics without alienating the politicians? How do you do politics without um, uh, overreaching and then getting cut out? And so I think that there's this fear to a certain degree of not being able, of being cut out of the dialogue Mm -hmm. So then there's the stance of not taking a strong stance or saying, well, we'll do, we'll negotiate with you on things in order to not get cut out. Um, The way I kind of liken it to is I'm in the process of, of, of downsizing in my own home where we're, we're selling our house and all that kind of stuff. And so I use the house selling analogy is like, well, you know, I really want to buy your house and here's my offer, but I'll pay another $15,000 if you really want me to. Okay. okay. And that's, <laughs> that's the kind of negotiating that I've seen happen. It's like, well, we really don't like this. We really don't want this, but if you do this, this, and this, then we'll be, then, then, okay. Yeah. And so the politicians do the, this, this, and this, and then people wonder why, well, why isn't, you know, I mean, why did, why did they do that? Well, it's a wishy-washy message. It's not a message that's really succinct and short. And there's a way to negotiate and be part of the negotiating process um, without actually giving away all of your negotiating power. And, and that's, the, that's the thing that I've run into, whether it's on the local level, whether it's on the statewide level or, you know, the national level, is that um, that to a certain degree, I'm not hearing folks really thinking like politicians. You have to get into the mind of a politician in order to be effective at this work. And if you don't understand how politicians think, then you're not going to be able to get as far as you want. And, and I'm not knocking the national associations at all. They're doing a good job as far as what they can do. Okay. Um, I think I think their intervention in, in working with making sure that that we were involved in the CARES Act more, those kinds mm-hmm. of things, self-employed, you know, making sure that that voice was heard. I think they do a really great job with some of those things. But like on the human trafficking issue, um, I'm deeply concerned about how uh, how our profession is dealing with it as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, to that end, I would encourage everyone to check out the the post you put up, Untangling Massage, Human Trafficking, and Prostitution. And in there, or I guess separate from that, is the analysis of the Polaris Report. Yeah, it's part of the Untangling series. There's several pieces to the Untangling series. And of course, with the COVID-19 thing, it's all been put on hold to a certain degree. But um, and that's why I put together what's called a scoping document that shows up on there, which is what each of the pieces are. Because one of the things that I've run into is uh, people saying, well, you yeah, you, you do a good job of critiquing that Polaris report, and you're saying that we shouldn't do establishment licensing, but you're not giving us anything that we can um, put forward 
in lieu of establishment licensing. And so in one of the parts of the scoping document, I outline uh, a scoping document basically sort of outlines what you're going to talk about. Um, and so I actually fleshed out that part of the scoping document of what kinds of things legislatively and ordinance wise uh, we can do um, in order to um, uh, mitigate human trafficking in massage therapy businesses in our profession um, without actually enacting uh, uh, establishment licensing. Because, it, and along with that, it's like, Part of it is also making the case of we don't have to have establishment licensing in order to um, make sure that our, our uh, uh, practices are being used as a cover or our industry is being used as a cover for that activity. Yeah. So you're trying to, to recruit and train a new generation of therapists to be sort of politically involved. Meanwhile, the enrollment in, in schools is down, which I noticed on your site, which surprised me. My, my sense was always like, there's just more and more therapists coming into the field, but that doesn't seem to be true. Yeah. If you look at the industry statistics that are coming out from AMTA and ABMP, um, you know, I haven't seen the latest ones, but it seems like through 2016, 2017, 2018, those statistics were starting to uh, show that, that the profession was getting fewer practitioners. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons for that. Um, yeah. I think you can point to a lack of standardization in schooling. I think you can point to the low wages. I think you can point to, um, uh, the, the, I also think that you can point to, um, uh, therapists getting tired of being propositioned, the, all those kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, and, and separating our profession from, from human trafficking uh, and prostitution. Um, I, I just think that there's a lot of different things that can, that you can point to, uh, that might, um, uh, lead to that trend. Which is a shame. I think there is a need, a greater need now more than ever for, for more of us as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sort of a big proponent of you know, collaboration over competition. I feel like there's enough clients to go around for everyone to thrive. Yep. There's just a lot, there's just a staggering number of people who've never had professional massage and body work before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is sort of where I, I try to put my, some of my energy in terms of just elevating the awareness and the importance of it, not just as a luxury, but as a necessary, important pillar of one's, uh, health and wellness and, and self-care practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Deb, thanks so much for, for being on the massage Hodge podcast to talk about all of these things. Uh, I'm going to link to the LMT body politic and, and encourage people to go check out some of the materials there. And you and I can chat a little bit more after this recording and we'll just wave goodbye to the, uh, the audience yeah, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. Thanks again so much uh, for being here. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. Great. All right. All right.